What's it called? Keister. We, we hide everything in our pussy. Keistering. Keistering is means keister that shit right away. It means put it away. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, keister. This stuff was keistered up my pussy. My vagina, excuse me. <laughs> so, Caroline, yeah, what? Yes. Uh, tell me about your past. Tell me about your life. My life. I was born in Newport Beach, California. Mm -hmm. um, my parents are Bob and Bernice Francis. My dad passed away, but mom's still alive. And uh, I lived in Santa Ana for a few years, and then we we moved up in the world, and we moved to Fountain Valley. Nice. And we, I grew, I went to private school, Liberty Christian School. Wouldn't know that, huh? And um, I got molested in fifth grade there and for the rest of the time till eighth grade there I had a miserable life because the person that molested me his children still went to the school and so did I my parents weren't going to back down and take me out of the school they went to the police he got his own lie detector test he got away with it anyways the gist of it is this about 15 years later they, they caught him he was molesting his son his babysitters his daughter, but I had to go through all those years of everyone in the school thinking I lied and made it up because they were the rich family of the school. Oh, it's terrible. And they did everything for everybody. So from fifth grade to eighth grade, I lived in hell because I didn't get invited to certain things because parents thought I made it up. Oh. But boy, later on, I bet they figured that out and they saw it on the, in the paper. Douglas Whitney, yeah, he's the one who molested me. Yeah, that's when my life changed. I was a happy child. I, I got perfect grades. I still got perfect grades, but something happened to me after that. Something changed in me, and I never was the same. Because, number one, because they didn't believe me, and I felt like, well, that's what the police are for, you know? And, um, Something changed in me, and that's when I became promiscuous. I didn't have sex till I was 17, but I did everything else. Promiscuous probably happened about 17, but I, I was curious about things. But anyways, you want me to keep going on? Sure, that? sure. Um, but after I had sex the first time, then it was on and cracking. Then I met this guy who was, uh, who was. He was 27, I was 17, and it was my birthday coming up. So uh, I met him, and I started doing cocaine with him, because he was 27. He was one of the owners of Billabong, okay? He had it, he had it going on. He, um, I was 17, living in this big beach house in Huntington Beach, but I still wasn't the same. I changed from that nice little girl that I was. I changed, and I started doing cocaine with him, snorting it once in a while. He would he would get with his buddies once in a while and snort, and I would. All of his friends were pro surfers. He was a pro surfer. I always loved pro surfers. Hmm. I'd die for him. He's a goofy foot. He won the Caton Amateur. He was hot. He owned, he owned part of Billabong. Here I am, 17. So after snorting coke, I um. I did, I did a little bit of speed. Well, he got hooked on speed. And he lost everything through a, a, a time because he had a lot of money to fuck off. Mm. But he eventually lost. He sold Ella Billabong, started a company called Soul. He lost that. And that was the demise of our relationship was crystal meth because I really loved him and he loved me. I was engaged to him. I thought we'd be together forever. Anyways, after that, he ended up hooking up with a porn star type of gal, and I didn't eat for a month. And I never really was the same after that either, Re relationship-wise. I was with him for five years. I felt like, fuck it, you know? I'm just gonna fuck guys, and um, I got, I started drinking more. And then uh, I uh, 
I dated Charlie Sheen, you know. I never knew that was a, to, to tell you, my friend Gigi introduced me to him. I never knew that she was getting paid for me. I never knew I was a prostitute. Oh, jeez. Okay, I, 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 when I say prostitute, I didn't know I was supposedly one. I wasn't one. I had never sold sex for money, ever. So after I found out she was getting money for me a lot, like she got to go to the ATM every time he saw me go, go to town, you know. Then he would offer me money. He never treated me like a prostitute. Always treated me like, like a precious gem. Mm -hmm. I don't believe any of the stories I hear in the media at all, because I spend enough time with him that I know the hitting and stuff. He walks away from girls and stuff. Anyways, long story short, Gigi introduces him to me. So then he starts giving me money, a lot of money. Um, but never hears for sex. He would he would say, I want to let's. He'd go in his office and he'd write me a check to. He'd be like, What charity is this for? <laughs> you know, and I'd get a check for five, seven, eight thousand dollars. Nice. Things like that. And he was really good to me. He taught me a lot. I went to Costa Rica with him. I went to Costa Rica with him right after my brother passed away. My brother was a fighter pilot. And um, I drank so much, I, I blacked out pretty much the whole trip. Because Tom had just died, and I was with Charlie, and of course we had piles of cocaine. When we got off the, out of the freaking car... Who, who's Tom? My brother was... Tom was my brother. Oh, your brother passed away. When me and Charlie got out of the fucking limo in Costa Rica, it was like... <sighs> we had so much cocaine. It wasn't even funny. Piles of so you can imagine. Um, Charlie kind of broke my heart a little bit, but I had to expect that would happen. Um, anyways, um, after, during that time, I had um, I had tried to stop drinking several times, but I couldn't do it on my own. Um, I kept going back to it, and. Um, so I joined AA, that didn't really help. Then uh, one girl introduced me, okay, well, I had Jeff as a boyfriend and I, I used to date this guy, William Shockley, he was on that show, Dr. Queen Med Medicine Woman. We never did drugs together, a little bit of coke, we smoked a lot of weed, and we drank a lot. My drinking escalated during that time, a year and a half with him, living with him, hmm. my, my alcoholism got, worse. So after that, I, um, I left him and I met my baby's dad, Darren, who was wonderful to me and tried to help me all that he could. And then uh, I broke up with him and he decided we, we were still friends. He took me out for my birthday and that's when I got pregnant with Kayla. We weren't together anymore. We, we still loved each other for friends. Mm. And so after about 10 Mai Tais, <laughs> we went back to Ramirez Canyon, and there was Kayla, my, my daughter, who's 13 now, and doing really good. Mm. And I have a relationship with her to, to this day now. That's great. It's getting better. But um, as you can see, you know, I'm hooked on heroin. I truly believe that when people say drugs escalate, you want to start smoking weed, and um, you think you're going to just keep smoking weed, it's bullshit, you know, for, you some, for most people, it escalates. There are some people that can do it and walk there away from it. There are some people, yes there are. I'd say there's about 25% of the people that can just smoke weed and have a couple drinks, and it's cool. But I think maybe maybe sixty percent. Did people. Did you see it happening early on, or did it just kind of take over? I, and I saw myself being depressed and sad, not knowing who to talk to or why it was happening. I lost my brother. That was really super hard because they didn't find his body. This is Iraq. This was, uh, first? no, this was routine exercises off the Kitty Hawk in 96. Oh. And mom had called me that morning. She was driving and said, I heard there was a prowler accident. He flew the prowler. It's a 
$65 million plane anyways. Mom said there was an accident. Didn't think anything of it. We go the whole day. They have to reach you either Western Union or at your door. They never came to our door. And it's 11 o'clock at night, so we think we're home free. I go in my side of the, my wing of the house, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. And then I ran, and me and my mom had to hear that Lieutenant Thomas Robert Francis, U.S. Navy, is presumed dead or lost at sea. And my dad wasn't even home. He was in Vegas. He never used to ever leave. But I think God spared him that, that time. Because that, that, that situation with the chaplain, my mom has clear doors. I'll never forget it to this day. In fact, it haunts me, seeing the officer and the chaplain through the glass. And having me, my mom and me wouldn't open the door. And then finally she composed herself and said, OK, stop crying, stop screaming. We're opening the door. And that's when it happened. Hmm. And then that crushed me. It, it, it just, just that the, the seeing that the chaplain and the officer, plus obviously the news, and then hearing that they didn't find my brother's body and um, not being able to, to bury him was really hard for us. And so I found myself, even that night, in a blackout, just drunk, you know, drinking. How old were you at this time? I was 26, 25 or 26, yeah. Yeah, 96. I was, if I'm 40 right now, how old was I in 96? Mm, and I had to go when I'm on heroin. 14, 15 years ago, so. So 30. 34? 25. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, 25. 25, yeah, I was 25 years old. At my, I'm supposed to be at the prime of my life. I didn't have any babies. And I didn't, you know, I was free. I had a good job. I always had good jobs. I worked for Ocean Pacific Division of Bailey Corporation as a merchandise assistant. I got my esthetician's license and I did very well in Calabasas. I had me I have means to make money. And were you still doing drugs at this time? No, I was never doing drugs. Oh, so you got off? This is these are years before. Oh, this this is all before I was doing heroin when I was being an esthetician at Rosie Skin Care in Calabasas. I I was I was making good. So everything kind of kicked in after your brother passed away? Yeah, the alcohol. But the heroin started in, I lived in Calabasas at Malibu Canyon Apartments. And uh, I met this chick, Belinda. And um, I never, I couldn't stand heroin addicts. You couldn't even be around me if you did heroin. Heroin was the bad word. My dad always told me my whole life, he said, never get on heroin. Because those heroin addicts, they can never get off of it. And, got on it. Anyways, um, How did you first get on heroin? What? Well, anyways, Belinda <laughs> used to, I, I would be hanging out with her and she'd be smoking it on foil like I am right here. And I'd be wondering like, what the fuck? I thought junkies slammed, you know? I thought they motherfucking just jacked their arm up and, well, she, she was alert. She was cleaning her house and doing all kinds of shit while she was smoking this dope. So I didn't, I didn't do it then. I said, I asked her questions about it, okay? Then she offered me some, and this girl, Julie Justice, was there, and she said, don't you dare give Caroline that. You're dealing with the devil. If you dare give Caroline that shit, I'm gonna beat your ass. Well, Julie left, and I tried it. And I went home to my place in Calabasas. I sat on my couch, and I swear it was like zen. I didn't feel the molestation. I didn't feel the breakups. I didn't feel my brother's death. I didn't feel shit. I just felt like everything was going to be okay. And from then on, the following day, I started buying dope for Belinda and her husband. I didn't know quantity, but they used me as a tool to buy their dope, okay? Well, I, got, I found a dealer in Topanga Canyon. And that was all good. Every day I drive to, to, to Topanga Canyon, I'd buy $100 worth of dope. I was running a household, I had a babe, daughter, going to PTA meetings, running game, just doing, keeping up with everything. No one knew, not even my, my mate, because mm -hmm. I did it outside in the laundry, laundry room that was detached from our house. I took the, the uh, what do you call them? Uh, I took the bulb out of the, out of the 
Socket. I have the socket, so nobody would ever want to go in that room. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I made it so unattractive, so that was my room. I put the bulb in when I went in. Anyways, I got on that. My dealer got busted in Topanga, and somebody told me, go to Skid Row. Okay, so here I am in a freaking BMW wagon pulling up to San Julian. And I met this lady named Scooter in a wheelchair, and she was my first dealer. And that's when I got my first heroin. And I'd pull around the block, and I'd do bags, and I had money. And um, I didn't think my life was being ruined, because I was smoking it. I was going back to Malibu. Mm -hmm. I did all this while my daughter was at school, unfortunately. Um, I don't, I'm not proud of that. I know it's fucking so wrong, but I did it. But I don't think it takes away from, from the fact that I love my daughter. And I love her as much. I want to say one thing. Drug addicts can still love their children as much as they did when that baby was born. I believe that. But, but for some reason, we, we, we do what we do. But it doesn't take the love away. Okay? It doesn't mean you don't love your children. Of course. Some people, but not me. Anyways, so I um, came down here and then uh, Scooter got busted and so I started making my way and then one day I wanted to get really high and I was doing crack and I decided I'll get a hotel, okay? I'll call Jeff. Kayla was with her dad for two weeks, so there was no reason for me to be home. Jeff and me had already been having problems. He was going to Cabo a lot, so I stayed in a hotel. Well. Anyways, about a month later, Kayla's dad, when Jeff found out I was doing this shit, Kayla's, he called Kayla's dad, my daughter's dad, and said, I think Kayla needs to come with you and Caroline needs to go to rehab. That was the plan. Well, then she went with her dad, and I stayed down here. I didn't go to rehab. And I stayed over and over in hotels and over and over. And I didn't run out of money for a long time. Hmm. But when I did, I had gotten offers for prostitution before, and I'd be like, why well, shut the fuck up? But one day it dawned on me, well, I could be a prostitute. I swear, it never even entered my mind to be a prostitute. Okay, and then all of a sudden I was like, I could be a prostitute. Give me some condoms. And I went out there. I think the first car that picked me up was a guy in a black Tahoe. And um, he ended up to be a cop. Mm. Later on, about a year later, a cop car was following me. I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't do anything. All of a sudden, I'm like, well, okay, whatever. He pulls over, opens the window, and I look at him, and he said, your message box is full. You got to clear your messages. And I looked at him, and I go, you're a fucking cop? You bastard. You could help me out on all these cases. <laughs> yes, that was the first trick was a cop. Okay, and still to this day we date. Wow. Me and him, he's a sheriff, he's a captain, he's a <laughs> Okay, but I'm not, t he's not from this area, maybe not. <laughs> These aren't the sheriffs. Okay. Anyways, um, and then I went from there and um, I've, I've dealt with some crazy tricks, tricks or dates. Um, what else, do you wanna hear some more? Or? Um, that about right? Does that sum it up? Yeah, that's that's a great I've story. Now, when, when I when I tell me tell, tell us where you, where you were when I first found you, you uh, were you were with uh, I was over Chicago. In Chicago. We had this backyard of this this, uh, this parking lot behind a fish market. Behind a fish market, yeah. Well, next to fish market. And Chicago's a squatter. Yeah, Chicago's a squatter. And he has a shack made of like cardboard and plywood and just scraps. Yeah, we had actually where where I lived, it was like a um, it was like a a uh, big uh, plywood uh, sh uh, bookcase, but it was thick, okay? And I had the bottom shelf. It was like this much room I had to sleep, okay? Kids you not. Michelle had the middle and Chicago had the top. And that's where we lived and that's where you found us. Right, I remember the first time I walked in, I was there several yeah. times, but the first time I walk in and here's this short little black guy who likes to talk fast with four Puffy beautiful four women. Hoes. Four beautiful women all either passed out or Half naked. Or shooting up. Or and he's having, yeah, shooting, yeah. He's having sex with all of you guys? Uh, not me. Not you. Uh, he had it one time and then he, I made him wear a condom and then 
he decided that he was going to try to pull game on me and say I'm not wearing a condom. Well, that ended our sexual relationship. Mm. It also made me have to pay to live there. But I didn't mind because I don't want to be fucking him. Okay, because I don't fuck without condoms, mm. especially somebody like that. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so anyways, yeah, we were living in that shack. Then he got he got we got we got busted the LAPD the red shirts man we went through so much shit over there one day the red shirt said get over there we're gonna handcuff you I go fuck you and I started running yeah. I, I I I outran them <laughs> I got away from the red shirts because they don't have guns they just have cuffs so if somebody doesn't have a gun you better believe I'm gonna outrun them you know if I can so yeah you met me there and then. Uh, from then on, I got I got a little better, but then I came back, and, and here we are. And you got pregnant again. I got pregnant again in, uh, right around my birthday. I was living at the Mayfair Hotel. I was on methadone for the beginning of that. Then I got back on dope, and I, I, I tried methadone. I tried my hardest. And then the, my baby's dad was always fucking with me and fucking every girl on the block and lying to me about it and me here and stuff. And I was pregnant and I got back on dope. Yes, I did. That's like the worst thing like I've done in my life. I don't have a lot of skeletons in my closet, but I did that to a baby. I did that to a baby. And to this day, it's like I can't forgive myself. In fact, I'm getting my tubes tied this week because I don't want to bring another baby in this world. I can't even take care of myself. But luckily, he doesn't have any problems, so we had him evaluated. He walked on his tippy toes. He's done with that. Now he walks flat on his feet. He took two steps. He seems to not have a hyperactivity problem. Um, anyways, I was on methadone at the end of my pregnancy too, but I did use. And his name is Charlie. And he's just so cute. Mm. He's, with your, he's with your mom. Huh? He's, he's, he's with your with mom. My mom, but since she has cancer, there's a chance they might not let her adopt him. If I get my shit together, I can have him. But it's a little bit harder now because it's been a little bit of some time. I am, um, but. That's really the worst thing I've done to anybody, to that baby. Like, I look at it now and I know it's, I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I couldn't stop. But it's something, this shit that numbs me and, and it makes me feel okay and it also gives me an appetite. It, 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 I don't know, but I don't know why I did it. But I know, I think if I had another baby, which I'm not, I know I, I couldn't do that again. I couldn't. And I hope he doesn't have problems in the future with his learning and all that stuff. But he seems okay right now. And my mom, she's a stern lady and she, she tells me the truth, you know. She thinks that I got lucky because of the fact that I smoke heroin. If I were shooting it, he would have been getting it, like, right so much more but the fact that I smoke it doesn't make it any better in life but pregnant it's like 90% better than shooting it so hopefully he doesn't have a lot of problems or any problems where do you see yourself in five or ten years I'd like to get married I don't want to be like a prostitute anymore I want to I want a partner. I want a man. I want to be better, but I want I, I want somebody in my life to share my life with. But no one's gonna really want somebody that's doing this, you know, or could afford it. Um, but you know, I care about Lou. Probably because he's like a father figure to me. He's 72. We became really close when my dad died. We were close before, but really, really close. There's a loan shark that, uh, that you stay with sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I don't know why I love him, but probably because he's the only one I can count on. You know. I don't know. Maybe I don't love him. Maybe I just think I love him. He's security. He's security, yeah. But I still have to pay him back, even though I, I fuck around with him. But now he, I, I caused a stink, and he made it so I owe him like 10% or something, you know. And usually, he doesn't even ask. I usually just kick him down a little bit of money here and there. But he's not a pimp, just for the record. He doesn't like pimps. He, he likes old school pimps, but these pimps nowadays, he knows I'm a renegade. A renegade means I don't have a pimp, and I never have had a pimp. I've never handed no motherfucker my money, ever. I've never had a pimp. I've had pimps try to gorilla pimp me and steal me, but I'm, I'm not, uh, and, and Lou's not a pimp. He is a loan shark. Yes, he is. But I hate it when people say that, because I'm not giving him my money for free. No way. Caroline, what would you say to your kids one day if they saw this? And Oh. In, in years down the road. <laughs> I would say, you already know what you know, but now you're seeing this, and I hope to God you never choose this road. And I hope that you listen to Grandma and Auntie and Daddy. And I hope you guys go to college. And I hope you guys have a good life. And I hope you find people in your life that love you. And I hope that, that because you don't have me in your life right now, that you don't choose the wrong person because that's what happens to kids that don't have their parents around. And I know that you see a shrink, Kayla. And I know that she tries to deal with you about losing me. But you always have me, you know? You always have me. You can always call me. You can always talk to me. But I hope that you will continue to see the therapist. And I hope you choose a good man for you. And know that I always love you. No matter what I do, I've been, I'm trying to get her back. She knows. This isn't just me leaving her. She knows that I've tried to get her back. And I've, I've tried a lot of things. But they basically, since I'm a heroin addict, I have. I don't have any fucking, I don't have any, uh, what's the word for it? I don't have any uh, credibility. Credibility, yeah. Even though I'm not a bullshitter and I'm not a thief, I can be in my mom's house without her there. Okay, she's got, she's in pocket, you know. I've never taken a goddamn thing for a drug. I've never, oh, I'm saying this to my kids. I've never, you know, the only thing I've ever done is I gave a guy my phone to get a bag of heroin and then I bought the phone back. I've never sold anything and I don't want you to ever be stealers. Don't ever be a thief. Because if you're a thief, in my book, you're, you're, uh, you're stupid and you will go to jail and you don't need to steal. You got grandma, you can even ask me for money. You know that, Kayla. I'll send you the money. And, um, uh, what I want to say to Charlie is, I'm sorry if I did anything to you that harmed you. If I if I did any anything, I didn't mean it, and I and I tried, but I didn't try hard enough. And I hope you'll forgive me, and I hope Kayla and I hope both of you guys will forgive me. In my and I hope we can have a relationship together someday. And I hope that. You don't get on drugs, Kayla. I hope you're not on drugs. Um, and I just, I hope you'll forgive me. I hope you'll remember your first 11 years of life, spending all the time with me. I hope you'll remember the good times. When Daddy always tries to make you think of the bad times, you know how many good times and how much I love you, how I'd bring you a smoothie to somebody's house if you didn't like what you they were making you or, or bring you a salad because you didn't want to eat macaroni and cheese. All those things I want you to remember. All the clothes and all the love and all the snuggles and the, all that stuff. I, I hope you remember that. You know, that's what I want you to remember. And, and, and 
about me, I'll get over this stuff. I'll get through it. I'll get through it. It's just taking me a little bit longer. This is the hardest drug to get off of if you ever have to try a drug. Don't do this drug, please. Please, don't try it. Smoking it doesn't matter. It's just as bad. Caroline, thank you so much.